Good afternoon. Welcome to the Euro NMD webinar uh, on painful neuropathies from diagnosis to treatment. I am Antonio Tavaye. I work as a clinical advisor to the ERN. And today's talk is about painful neuropathies and uh, is by Janneke Uchmakers. Uh, she studied medicine in Amsterdam when she and she followed with training in neurology in Maastricht uh, University Medical Center. Since the start of her education in 2010, she engaged in research about painful uh, neuropathies in close collaboration with the University of Wales, Professor Waxman and with the Institute Carlo Vesta in uh, Milan with Professor Warrior. In 2014, Janneke defended her dissertation on the role of sodium channel mutations in patients with small fiber neuropathy. Uh, an article from her thesis was awarded the Princess Beatrix uh, Spearfonds Annual Prize, uh, prize. Uh, for the best neuromuscular article published in 2012. Since January um, 2016, uh, Janneke is uh, working as a neurologist with a neuromuscular interest uh, in the Maastricht uh, University Medical Center. In addition to research uh, in the field of painful neuropathies, she's also uh, involved in myotonic dystrophy. She's a medical advisor for the diagnosis group Small Fiber Neuropathy of the Dutch Patients Organization for Neuromuscular Disorders, and she's also a board member of the Dutch Neuromuscular Center. Uh, before passing the word, uh, the floor to Janneke, I wish to welcome everybody as well. And remember that in the webinar format, you are not allowed to speak during the talk or to have uh, uh, your video on. However, in the end, you will be able to unmute and put questions to Janneke. You can also and should also uh, write those questions in the Q&A tool that is available for you during the webinar. And you can use the chat tool to discuss things among uh, the audience or with us as well. So uh, thank you, Janneke, for accepting to uh, give this talk. And we are looking forward to, um, to uh, learn from you. I'm going to stop my share. Please go ahead and share your screen, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to give this presentation uh, during this webinar. And uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, in relationship to this presentation. Well, today's presentation, it's all about pain. Everybody feels pain from time to time. And pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And in neuropathic pain, the pain is caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. And in the general population, about 5 to 10% of, of persons um, experience neuropathic pain. And today I will focus on the lesions of the neuropathic uh, 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 of the peripheral nervous system and more specifically on painful neuropathy. Well, as you might know, the peripheral nervous system consists of different nerve fibers and they are classified into uh, fibers regarding uh, their size, um, the accent diameter, the myelinization and the conduction velocity. And damage to the peripheral nerves can cause peripheral neuropathies. If all types of nerves are affected, you speak of a mixed fiber neuropathy. If there's an isolated large fiber neuropathy, only the large nerve fibers are affected. And in small fiber neuropathy, the A delta and C fibers are damaged. Today, I will speak about this small fiber neuropathy. And that's because the A delta and C fibers are responsible for the sensation of pain and thermal and um, 
uh, and thermal sensation, and they are also um, involved in autonomic nervous system. And because pain is the main future of pain uh, of small fiber neuropathy, I will focus on that. First, I will tell you something about the clinical picture of small fiber neuropathy. As I told you, pain is the main future of small fiber neuropathy. And patients describe it as a burning pain or pain with an electrical feeling or the feeling of pins and needles. And that are positive sensory symptoms. But in addition, there are also negative sens sensory uh, symptoms. And that's a hyperesthesia for pins and needles, for pinprick, and also for thermal sensations. A few years ago, we did a, a study on the pain dynamics in peripheral uh, uh, neuropathies, in small fiber neuropathy. And we included 165 patients who completed the pain diary on pain. And they finished the pain diary during four weeks and four days a week. And here you can see the pain scores during that period. And we asked them to score the pain during night and the pain during day. And we asked them to say at what time they experienced the maximum pain. In this picture, the pain during the day is um, reflected by a sun and the pain during night with the moon. And as you can see during the whole period, uh, patients always experience less pain during the day than at night. But when you look in more detail, the pain scores are uh, scored at a scale from 0 to 10. The difference is only 0 0.4 points. So that's really small. So the meaning of that yeah, is doubtful. Um, you can always also see that the pain during the weekend days is less than during daytime. Um, and that is quite stable during the four weeks. In addition, we asked also at what times they experienced the maximum pain. And half of the patients complained of pain at rest or during sleep. And yeah, that's compatible with um, yeah, the, the scores at night that were higher. And as you can see, it's quite striking that during exercise, uh, patients don't complain a lot about pain. And maybe that's because of they do not a lot of exercise because we didn't ask them, do you perform exercise at all? Uh, finally, we also asked the patients to point their pain at a body map. And here you can see most of the time the maximum pain was in the feet or the lower legs. This is also called a length dependent pattern. So in the longest nerve fibers, the complaint starts. But we know that there also are different patterns of pain. Well, first you can see the length dependent pattern, that's most common. But there's also a non length dependent pattern with more proximal pain zones and also more Apache uh, uh, distribution. And you can find that in immunological conditions or perineoplastic conditions. And uh, at last, you can see a focal small fiber neuropathy, uh, for example, burning mouse syndrome or the vulvodynia. And as I told you, uh, the small nerve fibers are not only responsible for pain, but also for, auto for the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and that's why patients also complain of that's autonomic symptoms like orthostatic dizziness, cardiac palpitations or bowel disturbances. When you perform neurological examination, a lot of tests will be normal. Uh, for example, the muscle strength, the tendon reflexes and the vibration sense. And that's because that are all modalities of the large nerve fibers. Um, you need to perform a thorough sensory exam examination because otherwise you will find any abnormalities. And um, in small fiber neuropathy patients, you can find uh, hyperalgesia. And that means that when you give a pain stimulus, um, the patient uh, feels an increased pain. And the same is for allodynia. That's when a normal stimulus is given that normally provokes no pain, now gives an increased pain re reaction. Besides the positive signs, also in neurological examination, there are negative signs. And that means that you can find a hypoesthesia with pinprick tests or a hypoesthesia for thermal tests. Well, after the clinical picture and the neurological examination, you can perform different diagnostic tools to establish the diagnosis. And the last year, we are searching for better diagnostic tools, and I will show some of them. Well, first, before we start to examine the specific small nerve fibers, um, it's 
in general, we always perform uh, a normal nerve conduction studies. Um, and with this study, you will examine the large nerve fibers and you expect an isolated small fiber neuropathy that is completely normal. Yeah, after that, you want to perform specific small fiber neuropathy tests and you can uh, do the quantification of small nerve fibers. But you can also test the function of the small nerve fibers. And one test and the most uh, reliable and common test is the skin biopsy. And uh, here you can see that we take a small punch biopsy from three millimeters, uh, 10 centimeters above the lateral malleolus of the ankle. And when we take a skin biopsy and we stain it, we can see the small nerve fibers that cross the epidermis uh, through the basal membrane and the arrows point to the small nerve fibers. Well, to see the difference between patients and healthy controls, here I show you two different skin biopsies. And uh, in the first picture, you only see one nerve fiber that crosses the basal membrane. And in the healthy control, you can see six nerve fibers. And we express the nerve fiber density in fibers per millimeter. And as you can see, it's higher in the healthy control than in the patient. But yeah, when do we know if something is normal and is abnormal? Um, yeah, we know that because there are normative values. They are collected by skin biopsies from 550 healthy persons. And they are collected in eight different uh, laboratories in USA, Europe, and Asia. And uh, we have chosen different age groups and uh, we chose um, to do it for both gender. gender. And um, we chose the fifth percentile as cut off value um, for what is abnormal. So everything below the fifth percentile is considered to be abnormal. Uh, and if you have a patient with a clinical picture of small fiber neuropathy, that confirms the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy. And in this table, you can see that women have a higher uh, intraepidermal nerve fiber density compared to men. And that's during uh, the years uh, when you get older, uh, the nerve fiber density decreases. Another test also to quantify the small nerve fibers is the corneal confocal microscopy. And uh, an advantage compared to the skin biopsy is that this test is non-invasive. And with this test, you can visualize the small nerve fibers in the cornea. Um, and then you can see these pictures. Um, the first pictures show the um, cornea of healthy persons, and uh, it's comparable with the skin biopsy that in young persons, you see a lot of nerve fibers and in older persons, um, they become uh, less. And in diabetes mellitus, this test has been shown to be a value. Um, picture A is a healthy control, picture B is a patient with diabetes mellitus, and you can see the great difference. And they also found in diabetes mellitus that it reacts uh, on, on uh, treatments. In patients that had a pancreas transplantation, there was a regeneration of the nerve fibers. This is a really nice biomarker to uh, check the efficacy of treatment. Uh, however, in small fiber neuropathy, uh, larger series are needed um, to investigate the value of this test. Well, besides the quantification of small nerve fibers, I told you that you can also test the function of small nerve fibers. And the most commonly um, uh, test is the quantitative sensory testing. And more specific, we perform the temperature threshold testing. And patients are asked um, to say when they feel a warmth of cold stimulus at the feet and their hands, and then to push the button. And also for this test, there are normative values for age and gender. Um, and then you can see if it um, uh, fits with small fiber neuropathy. But this test has some really disadvantages because the patients need to be really concentrated uh, and alert and they need a cooperation of them. Uh, and what's also another disadvantage is that it doesn't uh, of, or it can't discriminate between lesions in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So in any lesion of the somatosensory uh, system, this test can be abnormal. Well, maybe a more um, uh, reliable test to test uh, the function of the small nerve fibers are the nociceptive evoked potentials. And also with this test, stimulus is given at the skin 
but now it's recorded uh, at the skull. So um, there's no need for a good cooperation of the patient. Um, and as you can see, you can different stimuli. Uh, you can give, uh, do it with a laser or with contact heat evoke potentials or with pain. Um, and for the contact heat evoke potentials, there are normative values. Um, but we found that um, also in healthy persons, sometimes um, there are no contact heat evoke potentials. So that makes it difficult to use it in clinical practice for small fiber neuropathy. And again, also for this test, uh, it doesn't discriminate between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Well, and then finally, uh, not only the quantification of small nerve fibers uh, and the function of the small nerve fibers uh, for pain and thermal sensation, but also autonomic testing could be a test um, to investigate if there is a small fiber neuropathy. Um, this is uh, a picture of the QSART. It's quite a complicated uh, test, um, but maybe in future it will also help us uh, with the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy. Uh, at the moment, it is not used uh, widely for that. Well, when can we uh, say it is small fiber neuropathy? Uh, the last years, uh, decades, there was a lot of discussion which tests should be the best and which criteria. Uh, but recently, uh, the group of Giuseppe Lauria et al. Uh, published a study about uh, the criteria. And uh, in a paper, they suggest that at least there must be a clinical phenotype with typically uh, clinical signs um, for the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy. And then the uh, skin biopsy can confirm the diagnosis and the thermal threshold testing can be also supportive. So this combination uh, is to date the best um, yeah, criteria for the diagnosis. And for a pure small fiber neuropathy, uh, it is not allowed to have large uh, nerve fiber involvement. So the uh, muscle strength uh, must be normal and also the nerve conduction studies. Uh, when you look at the epidemiology, uh, small fiber neuropathy is not a rare condition. Uh, we did a study uh, seven years ago uh, here in the south of the Netherlands, and there is a prevalence of 53 persons per 100 inhabitants. And probably the numbers are even higher because yeah, there's still a growing awareness for it. And small fiber neuropathy has a great negative impact on quality of life. Um, we performed, um, or we, um, uh, the patients uh, uh, completed the questionnaire SF36, and that's the questionnaire for quality of life with two domains, physical domain and a mental domain. And in this uh, picture, the blue bars are healthy controls and the orange bar is small fiber neuropathy patients. And as you can see, for both physical and mental domains, uh, the small fiber neuropathy patients score significantly lower. And when you compare it to other chronic conditions like uh, cardiac conditions uh, or hypertension, um, the small fiber neuropathy patients also score lower. And uh, if you look more in detail, they score low at the role functioning and at the body pain. Well, when you establish the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy, it's important to search for associated conditions. Uh, and that's because some of them are probably treatable. And as, if, uh, as also in other peripheral neuropathy, there are a lot of associated conditions in literature um, that might be a cause, but the exact pathophysiological mechanisms are still unclear. Uh, we performed a large cohort study in almost 1,000 small fiber neuropathy patients. And here I will show you some results of the acquired associated conditions. Uh, in almost 20%, an immunological underlying condition was found. In 7.7%, diabetes mellitus or glucose intolerance. And in almost 5%, a vitamin B12 uh, deficiency. And um, yeah, as you can see, uh, the percentage of diabetes is quite low, but that's because uh, in the Netherlands, most of the time they are not referred to the neurologist. So that's why we didn't see them. And in almost 50% of patients, no associated condition was found. And in 25% uh, of patients who had already an associated condition, an extra associated condition was found. So it's always important 
uh, to do some extra tests when you see a patient with small fiber neuropathy. Well, when the diagnosis is made and you have found an underlying condition, the first step is to treat that underlying condition. But yeah, that is not always successful and then the treatment is insufficient. And that's why there are different uh, algorithms to treat the neuropathic pain. Well, in this uh, algorithm, you can see some pharmacological options. Uh, first line treatment consists of SNRIs and anticonvulsants. Um, if that is insufficient, you can combine uh, the drugs uh, or add a weak opioids or even uh, when that works, that doesn't work, a strong opioid. Um, but those yeah, have really strong side effects and there's a risk for addiction. So be careful with that. And there are also options for focal topical therapy, um, but you can always only use that when you have focal pain. So when there's only pain in the feet, you can do a lidocaine or capsaicine patch. And it's also always important also to have attention for the psychological factors. So um, to seek help uh, uh, by a psychologist or psychiatrist or um, yeah, at a rehabilitation clinic. And when you look at uh, uh, neuropathic pain drugs, the pain relief is quite disappointing. Uh, in these patients, only in 50% of patients, a pain relief of 15% will be achieved. So that's quite low. And there are also a lot of side effects and especially side effects concerning the central nervous system um, or cardiac side effects. And that's why patients uh, sometimes quit the medication before uh, they could even uh, experience a, a positive effect of it. And yeah, how could we improve the treatment options? Um, maybe when we unravel the pathophysiological mechanisms because when we know where the problem is, we can use that as a target for therapy. And yeah, that was something we were thinking about. And about a decade ago, uh, we did this clinical observation. We had all our patients with painful small fiber neuropathy. And yeah, they had different underlying associated conditions. But yeah, why is it possible that they all have the same clinical phenotype? And we were thinking, might there be a common pathophysiological pathway? And then we were searching for some key players and then the sodium channels drew our attention. And I'm gonna explain uh, why we thought about sodium channels. Here you can see a schematic uh, picture of a voltage-gated sodium channel. And um, it's a transmembrane uh, polypeptide. Uh, with four domains and when you fold the domains together it forms a pore through which the sodium can go into the cell and there's also an ancillary a beta subunit and that is um, necessary for the anchoring and the kinetics and in the small nerve fibers uh, they're uh, preferentially uh, 0.7 1.8 and 1.9 are expressed and they are encoded respectively by the genes SCN9A, 10A, and 11A. And before thinking of that, there are, were already some human pain conditions with an SCN9A mutation. First, there is the primary erythromalgia or erythromalgia. And these patients complain from red, swollen, burning hands and feet um, that aggravates with warmth and exercise. And there's also an other condition, paroxysmal uh, extreme pain disorder, also PEPD. And these patients have attacks of pain in the eyes, the jaws, and the buttocks. And uh, these two conditions have in common that there is a gain of function mutation of the SCN9A gene. On the other hand, there are also diseases with loss of function of the SCN9A uh, gene. And uh, for example, this is in the congenital intensity of pain. Um, the voltage-gated sodium channels are responsible uh, for the signaling in the nerve fibers uh, for generation of the action potential. And here you can see uh, in a nociception, when there is a pain stimulus, channel will open, the sodium will go into the cell. Uh, there is a depolarization of the cell and then you will see the action, action potential. And uh, when the channel is dysfunctional, it can be a spontaneous firing 
and yeah, the stimuli will also go to the brain. Um, yeah, well, how can you uh, study uh, the mutations if they are really gain of function mutations or loss of function mutations? Uh, therefore, you can use the patch clamp analysis and then you compare a wild type uh, channel with a mutated channel. And then you have two different types of patch clamp analysis. First, you have the voltage clamp. Um, and they are using hex cells for that. And that says something about the channel function. So about the different states of the channel. And on the other hand, you have also the current clamp. And then you get information about the channel excitability. Um, you get information about the resting membrane potential, the current threshold, spontaneous firing, and the firing frequency. And for this test, those root ganglion neurons are used uh, from rats. Yeah, and then we were thinking, uh, we had the patients with the SCN9A genes, the erythromalalgia, the PEPD, and they showed some similarities with our small fiber neuropathy patients. So we thought, well, if we do a DNA analysis in these patients, maybe we can find mutations in the SCN9A gene. And for this study, we used patients with an abnormal skin biopsy and abnormal QST. Um, so that were really strict criteria. And in that study, we had 44 patients and in eight, a mutation was found. So there was a quite high percentage of 28%. And here you can see the different uh, locations of the mutations in the alpha subunit of the NOF 1.7 channel. And um, here is an example of the patch clamp analysis um, of one of the mutations of these patients. And in this figure, the red lines and red bars um, reflect the mutation and uh, the white and the black um, lines and bars are the wild type channels. And then in C, um, that reflects the slow inactivation. You can see that the mutated channel has an impaired slow inactivation. And D, you can see that the resting membrane potential is depolarized. And E, that the current threshold is lower. And that results in a higher firing frequency in F and more spontaneous firing in G. And in conclusion, uh, you can say that there is a hyper excitability of the dorsal root ganglion neurons. Um, yeah, then when we looked at our patients, uh, first I said, well, there is a, a similar clinical phenotype, but there were some differences. In one particular mutation, the patients had pain, but they also had a lot of autonomic complaints. And in another mutation, the patients only experienced pain without autonomic complaints. And um, yeah, we looked at the different cell backgrounds to find uh, an explanation for that. When we look at the dorsal root ganglion neurons, um, both mutations um, had more spontaneous firing. And the firing frequency was also um, higher for both mutations compared with wild type channels. And the resting membrane potential was lower and the current threshold uh, was lower. And we concluded that there was hyper excitability of both mutations in the dorsal root ganglion neurons. And it was, uh, yeah, according to clinical picture, picture with a lot of pain. But when we looked at the sympathetic ganglion neurons, uh, then we saw difference. The mutation of the patients with a lot of autonomic complaints uh, showed less spontaneous firing. And also the firing frequency was lower. The resting membrane potential was also lower, but the current threshold was higher. So in conclusion, in this ganglion neurons, there was no effect for the mutation with the patients that had only pain, but was hyper excitable for the patients with a lot of autonomic symptoms. So that's quite interesting that you always have to look at the cell background. Another example um, for differences in clinical phenotype is that uh, you can have a length dependence pattern, but also a pattern with a lot of facial pain. And to study that, we performed again um, the patch clamp analysis in those root ganglion neurons, and uh, we saw a hyper excitability. But we also performed it in trigeminal neurons, and also in these cells, there was a hyper excitability of the neurons. So that's an explanation why these patients had both pain in their face and in their extremities. 
we also uh, found one family with a, a striking phenotype. Uh, this man has the clinical picture of erythromelalgia, so with the red hand and feet, and that's aggravated by warmth and exercise. But this patient had also the clinical symptoms of small fiber neuropathy, and he had really short hand and feet. His father and his brother had the same complaints, but to a lesser extent. And all these persons in his family with his clinical phenotype had a gain of function mutation in the SCN9A gene. And it's interesting that in this patient, both small fiber neuropathy and erythromelalgia was present. So we thought after um, the finding of the uh, voltage gated sodium channel mutations in our patients, that it's maybe a spectrum. Uh, you have the small fiber neuropathy, erythromelalgia, but also the FABD. And yeah, they can also share some symptoms of that. Yeah, as I already told you, uh, besides the NAV 1.7, also NAV 1.8 and NAV 1.9 um, are expressed in the small nerve fibers. And uh, yeah, we also studied that in our patients and found mutations. Yeah, the last years we collected about thousands of patients. And for this study, uh, we had less stringent criteria because now uh, yeah, we still wanted the typical clinical picture of small fiber neuropathy, but now uh, it was okay if only uh, one of the two examinations, so the skin biopsy or the QST was abnormal and some both were abnormal. Um, yeah, we did DNA analysis for the SCN9A, 10A and 11A gene. Uh, but when you find a variant, it's important um, to predict the pathogenicity. And yeah, I showed you the patch clamp analysis, but they are quite complicated and time consuming and really expensive. Um, so it's, it's better uh, to also look at the uh, medical history, uh, the cost segregation in a family and to use prediction models. And based on that, you can say something about um, yeah, the probability if the mutation or the variant is pathogenic. And here is a flow chart with all the patients that were uh, studied. Uh, and in total, we studied um, 1,100 small fiber neuropathy patients and in 132, a potentially uh, pathogenic variant in the SCN9, 10, or 11 gene uh, was found. So that's around 12%. And in more in detail, uh, we found the most mutations in the SCN9A gene and 5%. And here you can see in which domain they were uh, found. This is for the SCN10A gene. It's in about 4%. And in the SCN11A gene, it was in 3%. And well, it would be nice if you could predict in a patient if uh, he or she harbors uh, a voltage-gated sodium channel variant or not. So that's why we also looked at the clinical characteristics, um, at the diagnostic tools, but also at the complaints like erythromelalgia, H, cramps, family history, and uh, in which circumstances uh, the pain um, increased, uh, like warmth, cold, exercise, or at rest. And, uh, and here, um, the black bars are the persons, uh, the patients without a variant and the white bars with a variant and only for the family history and for uh, increase of pain by warmth, um, there is a difference uh, between patients with a variant and without a variant. And uh, when we uh, subdivide it in the specific variants, there's only a difference for patients with erythromelalgia and uh, patients with an SCN9A variant more fre frequently reported erythromelalgia complaints. So overall, there are no great differences in clinical characteristics between patients with or without a voltage-gated sodium channel mutation. So we always advise uh, to perform the DNA anal analysis in all of those patients. Um, yeah, I have showed that with the voltage-gated sodium channel mutations, uh, you can explain the clinical picture of the small fiber neuropathy patients, and it depends on the cell backgrounds uh, in which they, um, uh, they are expressed. Uh, but we were wondering, can we also explain the axonal degeneration in the skin biopsy? Because when we perform a skin biopsy, we see less neurofibers, 
And can we explain that by the mutations? And uh, normally, uh, sodium uh, goes into the cell, and then a sodium calcium exchanger pumps calcium outside the cell. And you can imagine that if there is a lot of sodium uh, into the cell, uh, it will work the other way around, and then calcium will go into the cell, and maybe that can lead to external degeneration. Well, the group of Yale studied that in vitro, and the left picture is a wild-type uh, neuron or a neuron with a wild-type uh, voltage-gated sodium channel, and the three other pictures are of a, a neuron with a voltage-gated sodium channel mutation that we have found in one of our patients. Uh, and as you can see in the bars in the table uh, below, um, in all mutations, the read outgrow was lower compared to the wild type. Um, and only for one mutation, it was significantly lower. And uh, we were thinking, well, if we then block that channel, um, does it cause regeneration? Well, it did. Here you can see what happens when you add, uh, add carbamazepine. Uh, you can see you get a regeneration um, and yeah, the uh, nerves are even more uh, than in the wild type uh, um, channel. Um, another uh, probably treatment could be to inhibit the sodium calcium exchanger. Um, we did that also. And then you can see the same effect as with the sodium channel blocker. So yeah, this proves that the voltage-gated sodium channel gene mutations can cause also the external degeneration. And it gives an explanation for the diminished intraepidermal neurofiber density. Yeah, I thought already that the patch clamp analysis uh, are really time consuming and really expensive. And that's why we're searching for a more high throughput model that's easier um, to test if um, variants are pathog pathogenic or not. And uh, we developed a zebrafish model and zebrafish um, show a lot of similarities with mammals. So that's quite interesting. And we made a model with two readouts uh, for small fiber neuropathy. First, we looked at the nerve fiber density in the caudal fin of the fish. Uh, and second, uh, more functionally, we tested the reaction of thermal uh, on thermal uh, stimuli. Uh, so the zebrafish are swimming in a kind of uh, pool in a zebra box. And when you elevate the temperature, you can see their behavior. Um, here's, you can see an example of the pictures of the caudal fin of a zebrafish embryo. Um, and for the um, studies for small fiber neuropathy, we use uh, the caudal fin of a zebrafish embryo uh, uh, 48 hours post fertilization. And uh, when you have a healthy um, zebrafish embryo with a SCN9A wild type channel, this is the density. And then when you have a fish with a mutated uh, SCN9A gene, uh, then you can see the density is decreased. So it's really nice that you have a good readout for that. Then when you look at the swim activity, um, here, the gray line is the, fish, uh, is the fish, the healthy fish with the wild type channel. And the uh, black line is the fish with the mutated channel. And as you can see, when the temperature is raising from the water of the fish, um, the fish with the mutated channel is swimming more actively. And um, uh, we think that it's a kind of allodynia because it's unpleasant that they feel the warm water. And uh, at the right picture, you can also see that the maximum activity um, is higher for the mutated fish. So yeah, the, the zebrafish uh, model is a nice model to study the pathogenicity of uh, the voltage-gated sodium channel variants. Well, um, yeah, why is it necessary uh, uh, that we found the voltage-gated sodium channels mutations? We can use it for targeted treatment, as I told before. Um, and uh, lecosamide is a sodium channel blocker that was already used in uh, the treatment of epilepsy. And uh, this sodium channel blocker selectively uh, blocks 9.3, 9.7, uh, and 1.8. And it enhances the slow and activation state 
And um, the target is especially uh, the hyper-excitable neurons. And we performed a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind crossover design study in 25 patients with an SCN9A gene mutation. And uh, all patients um, were treated with lacosamide and with a placebo, but they didn't know in which um, uh, order. Um, so they were randomized and then they received uh, or first the lacosamide or first the placebo. And after a tapering down period and a washout period, uh, they get it the other way around. And here you can see some of the results. Um, in this picture, the uh, mean of weekly average pain scores uh, are shown. And this is uh, again, the pain score on a scale from zero to 10. And uh, the patients with the right line first received lacosamide, and in the second period, the placebo. And the patients with the blue line first received placebo. And in the second um, um, part, the lacosamide. And as you can see, during the lacosamide period, patients experience less pain compared to placebo. And here you can see it in another way. Um, when you comp compare uh, treatment with lac lacosamide versus placebo, a one point decrease in mean average pain was received in 60% of patients with lacosamide versus 21 uh, with, uh, treated with placebo. And when you look at even a, a greater ex a decrease from two points, um, it's 33% versus 8.7%. And uh, we also asked the patients um, how they felt generally with the paycheck. And 40% uh, of patients during the lacosamide period feel uh, that they were very much improved compared to 12% in the placebo group. So that were really nice uh, results. And yeah, it confirms that uh, more selectively sodium channel blockers can be used in these patients. Well, I told that we uh, have found in 12% of patients uh, voltage-gated sodium channel genes mutations. So in more than 80% of patients, we didn't find any mutations. So we think there are other genetic factors and we are searching for other genes. Uh, we are uh, involved in two uh, U uh, European Union uh, funded projects for pain study and a pain net project. Um, and yeah, the upcoming years, we will show the results of that. Um, but besides uh, genes for channels, uh, the sodium channels or calcium channels or other channels, uh, there might also be a role for the mitochondria. And normally the mitochondria, they travel from the cell body uh, through the axon to distally. And during that transport, um, they can get damaged and especially with age, it can become worse. And yeah, as you can see, uh, the most distally parts of the nerves are most vulnerable. And that's why uh, yeah, you can imagine that in peripheral neuropathy, uh, mitochondria may play a role. And we know that in the small nerve fibers uh, that the density of mitochondria is quite high and that dysfunctional mitochondria uh, have been found in painful neuropathies and especially in uh, chemotherapy-induced painful neuropathy, uh, diabetes neuropathy, and HIV neuropathy. Um, yeah, uh, studies show these findings. And um, yeah, the, the mitochondria can be dysfunctional in different ways. Um, the fusion and fission are processes that are really important for the function of the uh, neurons. Uh, and we have looked if a problem in the fission maybe could lead to small fiber neuropathy in our zebrafish model of small fiber neuropathy. Um, so we had um, um, uh, the zebrafish um, and we knocked down a fission gene and we expected that it would lead uh, to a diminished nerve fiber density. And here you can see the results uh, completely to the right is the normal zebrafish, and to the left is the fish with the knockout of that fission gene. And as you can see, indeed, there is a reduced, reduced nerve fiber density. 
And also for the swimming activity, yeah, we found similar results as I showed uh, earlier for the voltage gated sodium channel genes. There is a uh, abnormal uh, swimming activity in the fishes uh, with a disturbed vision of the mitochondria. So that's a nice uh, proof of uh, concept. And it was also really nice uh, for the zebrafish models that it not only can be used uh, to test if some genes or gene mutations are pathogenic, um, but you can also add uh, a, a compound uh, for treatment uh, and to check if that yeah, will um, 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 diminish the complaints of the fish with the small fiber neuropathy. Okay, in conclusion, uh, small fiber neuropathy is a painful neuropathy involving selectively the A delta and C fibers. And typical clinical signs are required to establish the diagnosis. The skin biopsy and quantitative sensory testing are confirmatory diagnostic tests and current treatment options are disappointing. The voltage-gated sodium channel mutations play an important role in the pathophysiology of small fiber neuropathy, but there is a possible role for other genes. And these gene mutations are important because they are the key to targeted treatment. And the zebrafish model is promising to study new mutations and for testing new treatment options. Well, thank you for your attention. And I also want to thank uh, my colleagues from the Netherlands, but also from Yale University and Milano because uh, they were also uh, involved in all of these projects and, uh, yeah, and in all the studies. Thank you, Janneke. Uh, that was a brilliant uh, um, talk, and I think that it have the right amount of combination between things that are uh, clinical, as many of us are keen to to learn about the clinical side of it because they it helps us deal with our patients. And but they have, you provided also a lot of um, um, mechanism and um, substrate uh, information that is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're happy, we have now one question from Alejandra Perez del Real. Uh, she can unmute yourself. You can answer live, please. Uh, you can put your question live if you want. Otherwise, I can read it. You can um, unmute yourself, Alejandra. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for such a fantastic and attractive uh, chat. Um, I was uh, very surprised uh, by the idea of this uh, sodium uh, channel blockers and I would like to know whether uh, you find they might be applicable to peripheral autoimmune conditions such as GBS and CIDP. And you, uh, thank you for your question and the question if, if they also could work in that conditions or not. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, we know that also in uh, large neurofibro conditions like GBS, um, also sodium channels are involved, uh, but that are different sodium channels. Um, um, and and, and in, in the pain uh, in GBS, also the sodium channels are involved. Um, so it might uh, diminish the pain, uh, but if it also will work uh, to the uh, complete uh, illness, yeah, that's questionable because uh, yeah, it will not um, help for the complete uh, pathophysiology of the disease. But uh, yeah, uh, um, now we tested it only in patients with a sodium channel mutation, but we think it will also help in patients without a mutation because yeah, the sodium channels are involved uh, in the pain signaling. So uh, mm -hmm. when there is a problem and you block the channel, uh, yeah, you expect that it also will work uh, for patients without a mutation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so at the moment, I cannot see other questions. So I'm going to step in while they think what to uh, think yeah. about or to ask about. So, uh, Janneke, would you mind stop sharing your, your screen? Uh, yes. <laughs> and I will show something on my side. So, yes, here it is. 
right it's taking a bit too long yeah it's a bit slow <laughs> okay so i think now you're looking at the slides from the systematic review and meta-analysis I'm, I'm sure you you're acquainted with it mm -hmm. and of course my my question of course you've showed very elegant uh, study about glucosamide the sodium channel blocker which mm -hmm. in concept would be a very good therapy for the channel uh, so, uh, sodium channel uh, related uh, forms of these neuropathies mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at my slide on the on the division A, for instance, about the pain reduction, uh, and then you look to the right and see the medication stride, it's true that uh, the, the numbers in, in uh, between brackets mean the number of time points for collection of data. Uh, you will see that probably uh, it seems like that uh, it's not necessarily the ones, the medications that are um, sodium channel blockers that work the best. Mm -hmm. So you'll find, for instance, the GABAergic medications on top of the sodium channel blockers. Yes. And of course, uh, this is a bit debatable, and this meta analysis, for instance, is not uh, exactly fantastic in terms of effectiveness of treatments, as you've said in your talk. And uh, uh, the only one that looks better is the visual analog scale on the division B. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I wonder if that's the, there is any bias in the visual analog scale that uh, makes patients feel better about the medication. I don't know. So, uh, how do you you explain? Uh, or how, what's your comments uh, about these uh, lists of medications and the relative efficiency of them, mm -hmm. namely in terms of the uh, sodium channel blockers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the sodium channel blockers um, that are commercially uh, available. Um, like carbamazepine, uh, that's the most uh, common uh, sodium channel blocker, um, they are not selective. So they always also uh, block the sodium channels in the brain and it causes a lot of side effects. So before you reach uh, an adequate dosage for uh, diminishing the pain, yeah, they have so many side effects that they need to stop with a sodium channel blocker. So that might be a reason um, yeah, why there is less pain reduction because they don't use the right dosage uh, for also blocking sodium channels in the peripheral nerves. And yeah, there will be also other mechanisms um, in the other patients without sodium channel mutations um, that cause the pain. And maybe for that patient, the other drugs are better. But yeah, in most of the drugs, uh, yeah, give some pain relief, but yeah, it's not that um, suffi sufficient uh, in most of the patients. Uh, uh, so that's not the case for wacosamide, which is specific. Uh, Quite specific. Yes. <laughs> not completely because it's an anti-epileptic drug, but more than a carbamazepine. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, the wacosamide, so, um, sorry, this was the sharing. Uh, in terms of the wacosamide, um, did you have side effects uh, because of it or not? Yeah, there were some side effects, but they were um, uh, not that bad. So some had a bit uh, of dizziness or headache, but um, yeah, they were not substantial. Mm. Not vomits, because in epilepsy, vomits are one of the side effects or nausea, mm. it's one of the side effects. Yeah, I'm not sure, but not in a lot of patients. Okay, good. Excellent. So um, I'm going to stop my sharing. This is not useful anymore. Uh, let's see, we have here someone on the chat. Yep. So it's Teresinha. Welcome, Teresinha. So please unmute yourself and voice your question. Hi, Yannick. Thank you for, for this um, great uh, talk. I, I'd like to, to know because, well, 
it's been a long time since I've dealt with uh, small fiber neuropathies, but uh, um, small fiber neuropathy symptoms are are considered one of the first symptoms, for instance, in um, familial amyloidotic polyneuropathy, mm -hmm. um, namely in TTR, um, um, associated with the TTR mutations. I, I was wondering if in such a huge huge cohort as, as, as the one that you have collected, um, if you manage to, if you have uh, patients with mutations, especially in, in uh, TTR. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, we are in the Netherlands, we are the uh, only expertise, uh, center of expertise for small fiber neuropathy. So we see a lot of small fiber neuropathy patients from all over the Netherlands um, that uh, start, have the first complaints uh, is small fiber neuropathy. Um, so it's an interesting group um, to look if they have uh, FOP. And the last years, uh, we have the TTR gene in our gene panel. Um, but we never found a mutation in that gene. Uh, in, and I think that we already have tested about 500 patients. So yeah, until now we didn't find it. Um, yeah, but so I can imagine that someday we will find a mutation. Yeah. You should, do, you should have a collaboration with the, our Portuguese colleagues because they have a lot of uh, small fiber neuropathies and FAP. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I saw some really interesting talks from them. Yes. Do I have the right to ask another question? Of course. Um, it was, uh, I thought it was really, really interesting when you uh, were trying, when you were talking about the um, corneal confocal microscopy. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that you are already, I, I understood that um, you, there's still a need for um, normative values and uh, better, but it's something that you are um, already studying. studying. Yes, we are studying that. Uh, yeah, the normative values um, are collected, so there's a really nice uh, article uh, about that. Uh, and now we uh, did the examination uh, in 200 small fiber neuropathy patients, but we are still analyzing it. Uh, and yeah, it's questionable if it will uh, be a good uh, study in all patients with small fiber neuropathy, or maybe all, uh, only the patients with a non lang dependent pattern, because yeah, the eye maybe uh, it reflects the non lang dependent uh, patients. Uh, but until now, uh, yeah, we are still analyzing and waiting for the results. Thank you. I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> okay, just the last one. So you have sometimes patients that have very similar involvement in terms of small fiber neuropathy with very different intensities of pain, don't you? Mm -hmm. And so uh, where does the brain come into it? Because there are some biomarkers in the brain saying that those patients with pain may be different from the others. So yes. what's your take on that? Well, at the moment, uh, we are performing an fMRI study uh, yeah, to compare patients with small fiber neuropathy uh, to healthy controls. And uh, in that study, uh, uh, they get a warmth stimulus, uh, and then we can also see the reaction on that. So if there is a different pain signaling uh, in the patients and in the healthy controls, and we have a group of ide uh, idiopathic small fiber neuropathy patients and a group of patients with a sodium channel uh, gene mutation. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting <laughs> what the results will be. Yeah. Okay. When are you published? <laughs> you um, well, we finish it, I think, at the end of the year, so next summer or something like okay. that. Okay, <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So I don't see any more questions, and so I'm going to thank you very much for this marvelous presentation and this very thank good you. discussion, and uh, we'll keep in touch, hopefully. And uh, and uh, thank you very much and thank you to everybody who has been present. Uh, as you know, there will be a small um, survey or at the end of the session for the people attending through Zoom. And uh, by filling the survey, you may opt to fill it anonymously or to fill it with your email because if you put your email you will receive a certificate of attendance. So until the next webinar, bye now. Thank you. Thank you.